Well, yeah, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm Lee. Um, and yeah, thanks to the organizers for inviting me today to tell you about uh, June, the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. Um, so just a, a brief overview of where we're going. Um, I'll start with an introduction to the experiment uh, and a bit about uh, the, uh, the physics program as a whole um, before kind of concentrating on the long baseline neutrino oscillations. Um, and I'll also then mention a few other uh, physics highlights that uh, we've been working on. Uh, then I'll spend a little time towards the end on uh, a kind of broad prototyping uh, program we have. Um, so the experiment has, uh, there are roughly 1300 of us spread over 200 institutions. Uh, and those are then spread over about 30 countries uh, and so on. Um, this is our collaboration meeting from January 2020, which is the last time we were able to uh, be in one room. Um, so hopefully we'll see more pictures like that again soon. Um, so June's uh, next generation long baseline neutrino oscillation experiment. Um, it will, well, it's based in the US and the neutrino beam will come from Fermilab. Um, the neutrinos will pass through the near detector a few uh, hundred meters upstream of the target, downstream of the target, sorry. Um, and then they'll travel 800 miles or 1300 kilometers uh, through the earth and uh, end up at uh, the Sanford Underground Research Facility in South Dakota. Um, so in South Dakota, they will be intercepted by our 70 kiloton liquid argon far detector. Um, that's broken down into four different modules. Uh, this is about one mile underground. Um, so you should have very low backgrounds from cosmogenic sources. Um, and this, this fact also helps us have a, a, a wide physics program um, beyond just uh, being a long baseline oscillation experiment. So uh, the neutrino beam will be a new neutrino beam built at Fermilab. Um, it will take 120 GeV protons from the main injector and hit them onto a carbon target as is kind of standard these days. Um, the, the beam line will actually do a slight bump so that it helps point this down into the ground uh, so that it'll come out in South Dakota. Uh, it'll have an initial power of 1.2 megawatts um, that will be upgraded to 2.4. Um, it's, a, it's a wide band beam compared to a number of others. And so we don't run off axis, we run the far detectors on axis. Um, and this has the effect of having this kind of reasonably uniform flux between uh, one to four GeV or so. Um, as with all neutrino beams these days, it runs in uh, neutrino and anti-neutrino mode. So uh, the fluxes look pretty similar uh, between those two. Um, the far detector uh, and indeed part of the near detector will be liquid argon time projection chambers. Um, there are a few different designs, um, but the, the main working principle of all of them is mostly the same. Um, you have your cathode and an anode and some uh, fairly strong electric field at 500 volts per centimeter. Um, and some ionizing particle will pass through this, uh, your detector volume, liberate some electrons, and then your signal comes from drifting these electrons towards the anode. Um, so the first one I'll mention is the horizontal drift. Uh, by this, I mean that the electric field itself is horizontal uh, mm -hmm. and basically perpendicular to the beam. Um, so it has a 3.6 meter drift, uh, drift length, uh, meaning that uh, you need minus 180 kilovolts on the cathode uh, to get this required electric field. Uh, it's very similar to previous RTPCs in the fact that it has these three wire readout planes. Um, so we get from these th three wire readout planes, we basically get three 2D images um, of our events. So there are two uh, so-called induction planes um, where the electrons induce signals as they pass through them. Uh, and then the vertical wires on here, the orange ones, uh, represent the collection wires where we actually collect the, the drift in charges. 
Um, just to show what this actually looks like a bit more, um, this is a picture from, well, this is one half of Protogen, so one of the drift volumes. Uh, so you can see the Y readout planes on the left uh, and these white stripes in the uh, kind of embedded in the uh, anode here uh, are the photon detector systems, um, which in June will be uh, ex Arapukas. And this fairly large drift volume here uh, represents only this fairly small region of the, the full fire detector module. Um, we also have the vertical drift. Uh, so in this case, we drift the charges vertically, uh, either up or down, uh, depending where you are in the detector. Um, so the main differences here are the, the drift lengths, not twice as big, but quite substantially longer, uh, meaning you have a, a higher voltage on the cathode. Um, the readout isn't wire-based, it's made from a perforated uh, printed circuit board. So you basically have three layers of uh, strip readout uh, on this uh, PCB. Um, but otherwise, the, the main principle is the same. You still get these three 2D views of your interactions. Um, and in this case, the, the photon detector system is very similar, uh, but the, the detectors themselves will be located on the cryostat walls uh, and also probably some of them embedded uh, into the cathode. So just a little about the, these x -Arapukas. Um We use them to measure the scintillation light from the, the liquid argon. So this is in the vacuum ultraviolet, about 127 nanometers. Um, these are kind of... Um, a bit like a hybrid of a, a light trap and a light guide. Um, so you kind of trap the light inside this uh, detector region um, and wavelength shift it uh, from UV to, to visible light and then uh, read it out with uh, silicon photomultipliers. Um, there's a picture of a couple of them here being tested. Uh, and as I said, these are a, a bit of an evolution of the design of those that were tested in Protogen. Um, so kind of bringing this together, uh, this is what uh, the, the caverns will look like uh, in uh, SURF. So the neutrino beams coming in from the bottom right here. Um, there are these two long drifts where the detector modules will sit uh, and then a long uh, central cavern uh, that hosts various utilities like the, the cryogenic systems and uh, DAQ computing. So modules one and two will be the ones that are built at the front. Um, the first module will be horizontal drift. The second one will be vertical drift. And they'll each have a liquid argon mass of about 17 kilotons. Um, and this kind of forms a phase one of the fire detector. Uh, modules three and four will then complete the full detector. Um, and the, the choice of technology for these is uh, not fully confirmed yet. Um, the fire detector is becoming a reality. Uh, it's not just this picture anymore. Um, so the excavations have begun uh, for these caverns. Uh, here's a picture of the sort of digger you can fit underground where you have to build it again underground after you've taken it apart. Um, and some colleagues there uh, actually doing the hard work. So um, that's definitely uh, nice for us to see. Um, so moving closer to the beam, we have the near detector. When I say near detector, there's actually three detectors. Um, there's a, a liquid argon TPC, which we call ND La, uh, the, a gaseous argon TPC, uh, ND Gar, and uh, a kind of hybrid tracking system called SAND. So, as with you know, the current generation experiments, we need our near detector to provide us some key constraints for our um, oscillation analyses. So, measuring the neutrino flux. Um, measuring and constraining the neutrino and anti-neutrino cross-sections on argon. Um, we also measure some other target nuclei in SAND um, and constrain the, the response of LAR TPCs. So the ND LAR is a kind of much more modularized LAR TPC than the far detectors. It sits here at the front of the near detector hall. Uh, so it's the most upstream of the detectors has a 50 ton uh, fiducial mass and it's based on pixel readout. Um, this means that compared to the far detectors, it has native 3D um, imaging capability. 
uh, and it's based on the argon cube design that was uh, developed at Bern. And uh, a two by two demonstrator of this will begin testing at the Numi beam um, at Fermilab uh, next door to the Nova near detector. So the, the gaseous argon TPC sits immediately behind this, um, has a very uh, low detection threshold um, since it's a lot less dense than uh, liquid argon. Um, and it'll let us have four pi tracking capability for our cross section measurements. Uh, including kind of low energy protons. Um, it's also magnetized so that it can measure the escaping muons from ND law um, for both the, the momentum and the charge sign. SAND is the kind of on axis beam monitor. Um, it's a, a tracker surrounded by an ECAL uh, within a 0.6 Tesla magnet. The ECAL and the magnet uh, both come from the CLO experiment. Uh, in Italy, um, and its primary job is to monitor the neutrino beam, but it also has a, its own uh, measurement program for various different cross sections on different targets. So we heard a bit about prisms this morning. Um, this is a fairly extreme case of one, I guess. So the, the liquid argon and gaseous argon TPCs move along this track um, so they kind of start here on axis in front of sand and they can travel up to 33 meters off axis, which lets us kind of directly probe the energy dependence of these interactions um, and kind of do this in a, in a way that you can kind of decouple your flux from your uh, cross sections. Um, and a note that there will be a temporary muon spectrometer that sits here uh, as a placeholder for NDGAR uh, when we first switch on. Um, this will be a MINOS-like magnetized scintillator tracker that will purely be there to uh, measure the uh, muons that escape from uh, the liquid argon TPC. So the reason we want this prism approach is that, uh, as we've heard, the ND flux isn't the same as the far detector flux. Um, Back in the days of MINOS and things, you could uh, get around this, well, do a direct extrapolation and just um, accept the uncertainties that come with it. Um, but that's not something uh, we want to do as we enter this precision measurement era. Um, so this plot on the bottom left shows various distributions um, from the near detector flux as a function um, of the energy. So when we're on axis in this blue color, we have a very well, reasonably broad distribution. Um, and then as you migrate your detector further off axis, you get this characteristic uh, narrowing uh, and migration of your uh, flux to uh, lower uh, peak energy values. So the idea is to measure these uh, in beta, and then you can then uh, take various linear combinations of these different fluxes in order to try and match your far detector prediction. So over here is a, a fake data sample from the far detector and the, the blue part, sorry, the, the red part that makes up the majority of this field histogram uh, is the, the direct um, combinations of the near detector data. So the nice thing about this is uh, you get most of this spectrum with no dependence on your modeling because it comes directly from the near detector. Uh, but these small uh, backgrounds and a small correction here are the only place where your uh, interaction modeling comes in. So just um, uh, in the construction process, we'll begin with our 1.2 megawatt beam, as I said, uh, and our two far detector modules, the two at the front. And the near detector will be complete apart from uh, it will have this uh, temporary uh, spectrometer instead of the, the gaseous argon TPC. Um, and then the beam will be upgraded to 2.4 megawatts and the other two far detector modules will appear here. Uh, and the, the near detector will um, gain the gaseous argon TPC. Um, and this full configuration lets us reach the, the long-term goals of the experiment. Um, so I guess this is now a good time to point out the, the physics program. I mean, the, the main thing um, 
at least uh, by the name of the experiment, comes in at the three flavor oscillations. Um, so the key goals here are the search for CP violation in the neutrino sector, uh, measurement of the mass hierarchy or the mass ordering, I should say, um, and then precise measurements of the uh, oscillation parameters like theta one, three and theta two, three. Um, then we also have searches for supernova neutrinos, solar neutrinos, uh, I forgot to write down atmospheric neutrinos, um, and many beyond the standard model physics processes, uh, just to name a few of them, uh, barren number violation. Um, searches for dark matter, there are various ones of these, uh, non-standard interactions, sterile neutrinos, um, large extra dimensions, uh, and many other things uh, that I couldn't list on this slide. Um, and a, a kind of very large interaction cross-section uh, measurement program uh, using the near detectors. So very briefly, I realize I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Um, just in the, the standard way where we uh, expand out the PMNF matrix as three sub-matrices, uh, the ones we're interested in here are this first one, uh, where we have the new new disappearance sector for accelerators and uh, atmospherics, uh, and the central matrix that ties everything together, where with long baseline experiments, we can uh, measure theta one three and access the CP violating phase delta. Um, and then a brief reminder of the mass ordering. So we know that mu one uh, is lighter than mu two uh, from solar uh, matter effects and the definition that uh, mu one has the most mu e component in it. Uh, then that leaves us the question, is mu three the heaviest or the uh, lightest of the three? Um, and June's very large matter effect gives us a good sensitivity to uh, resolving these. Um, so yeah, aim to accurately measure these parameters and uh, if nature's kind and means there is CP violation, then we should be able to measure it. Um, there are many steps towards getting towards your uh, three flavor oscillation sensitivities. Um, you have to start off with your flux prediction and then some interaction model. Uh, from there, you can kind of go to your near detector simulation and via oscillations to the far detector. Um, you then do your event selections, uh, plug that into the fitting framework alongside a uh, detailed description of your systematics, and then uh, obtain your results from uh, your choice of fitting framework. So uh, a key component of this is the, your uh, neutrino flavor classification, uh, particularly in the far detector I'm talking about here. Um, so we want to be able to select new mu and, well, charge current new mu and charge current new E interactions uh, and get rid of as much of the background that typically comes from neutral current events. Uh, we use a convolutional neural network that we call the CVM uh, in order to predict these. Um, we, so this basically gives us a, a score, well, in this case, two scores that are you can roughly consider them as the probability of the event to be of these uh, new mu and new e uh, types. So I said before that we have three readout views um, for each event. So I'm just showing the collection plane here. Uh, and so our events look something like this. Uh, so for the disappearance analysis, we're obviously looking for the new mu events and they're characterized by this nice long muon. Um, the main background here comes from neutral current pi plus events. In this event, you can see there's a fairly long pi plus um, that you could start to confuse with a, a muon. And for the appearance analysis, then our signal new events look something like this. The, the characteristic electron shower emanating from the uh, vertex. Um, and the main background um, comes from neutral current pi zero events. Um, where in this example, you can see this photon shower uh, has started quite near to this interaction vertex. Um, so that's how these can be uh, misidentified. Um, more details of this uh, network can be found here. Um, so as I said, we basically get two scores from these, um, uh, from these uh, outputs of the network. So this one on the top left just shows the, the kind of new mu probability for different types of events. So the signal new mu events are in uh, this blue color and they pile up towards one on this log scale. 
uh, and the, the neutral current background is uh, pretty strongly uh, piling up towards zero there. Um, the story is much the same for the NUI events. Um, this time you get your signal and beam background NUIs piling up uh, at one. Uh, I mean, these beam backgrounds just have a different energy distribution, but they're otherwise identical. Um, and good separation with the background as well. So you can just apply a cut on these distributions to make your event selection. Uh, and when doing so, you get these efficiency distributions at the bottom. So these have the, um, the rough uh, spectrum you'd expect at the fire detector and then the overlaid uh, efficiency here. So we reached an efficiency of about 95% for disappearance uh, and the efficiency peaks about 90% uh, at the, the uh, flux peak for the uh, appearance. And just so in anti-neutrino mode, this is, it works slightly better um, just because of the, the kinematics of the interaction. So um, taking that into account, you end up with distributions like this. So these left two figures are the muon neutrino disappearance selections. Um, this one's for the neutrino mode, and this one's for the anti-neutrino mode. And um, you have a larger rock, uh, wrong sign background for the, the anti-neutrinos. Um, but we will be order 10,000 events in seven years. Um, and then for the appearance samples up here on the right, uh, it's much the same story. You get a, a bigger number of events uh, for the forward horn current. Uh, and the, the main background here comes from the intrinsic beam noise. And then this green component is the misidentified neutral current. Um, so then for the near detector, uh, in, the, in this analysis here, the, the long baseline sensitivities paper, um, we consider new mu interactions as a function of energy and inelasticity. Um, so that gives you these six plots here. Uh, there are actually 12 of them because we have separate distributions here for the, um, the forward horn current and reverse quantum current. So that's new mu dominated and anti new mu. Um, so you could then take those uh, four fire detector plots and the, the 12 near detector spectra and fit them simultaneously, uh, making sure you have a, a detailed treatment of flux cross-section and detector systematics. Um, and then the, the near detector spectra act to constrain these uh, systematics uh, um, as is uh, standard. So first of all, uh, looking at the mass ordering, um, this line here is the kind of five sigma discovery uh, for resolving the mass ordering. So you can see that June has a very, uh, very good ability to uh, measure this unambiguously. Uh, by that, I mean no dependence on other experiments or on uh, any values of the other oscillation parameters, which are the, the kind of um, the spread of values you can see in these uh, distributions. Um, the plot on the right shows what happens running with just phase one. Um, and for most of the, well, for 100% values of delta CP, um, we can probably reach five sigma here uh, and have a very uh, good precision on the actual value of delta N squared three two as well. Um, then considering CP violation, um, we have five sigma discovery potential for over 50% uh, of uh, true delta CP values. Um, and considering the kind of full exposure of the experiment uh, in green over here, this is the, the resolution on delta CP as a function of the true value. Um, we reach between um, seven uh, and 16 degrees. Um, and at this stage of the experiment, the resolution we have on our theta one three measurement is um, equivalent to that of the reactors. So um, there's, no, there's no dependence on other experiments to get this green uh, distribution here. Um, and again, um, if we're lucky and nature's kind, then we can reach three sigma in, in a few years um, in our phase one of the uh, construction. Um, now changing gear a bit and going from GEV scale down to MEV scale. Um, MEV scale physics with electron neutrinos. So this is both um, supernovae um, we're sensitive to the new E flux from supernova bursts. Um, this has a reasonably complex distribution, but uh, it includes this spike here uh, that comes from the initial uh, neutronization, um, where you basically convert all of your matter into neutrons. Um, 
And this is something unique uh, for June to be able to measure. Um, and in, um, if we're lucky enough to have a galactic supernova burst, which I think everybody's hoping for, um, we'll have thousands of events to, to measure. Um, then we've got a lot of ongoing work in the collaboration uh, on solar neutrinos. Um, we have some se uh, sensitivity to the uh, boron-8 and HEP fluxes. Those are shown in this kind of dark blue and orange components, um, respectively. Uh, and we'll be able to measure the uh, solar oscillation parameters um, from this work. Just a quick note that there are some proposals for the, the fourth module of June um, that might help uh, enhance some of this sensitivity to low energy physics whilst uh, also maintaining the performance we need for the uh, long baseline oscillation program. Um, there are a lot of beyond the standard model searches. Uh, I can't really talk about them uh, in any detail, um, but just to show a few plots, um, you can see the full details in this publication here that discusses uh, the whole program. But this is uh, the sterile neutrino search, for example. So this is in the kind of phase space that you're used to seeing from, uh, from Nini Boone and LSMD. Um, and this uh, curve from June takes into account new mu disappearance and uh, sterile driven uh, Nui appearance. Um, Non-standard interactions here, um, proton decay. Uh, in this example, this is the, the kind of K-on decay channel from proton decay, where you see this very nice uh, signature of your K-on decaying into the, the anti-muon and then into a Michel positron. Um, there's a lot of dark matter searches. Uh, can't really see what's going on here, but um, you can see that uh, this is an inelastic boosted dark matter um, search at the far detector can probe new regions of this phase space. Likewise, we can probe new regions um, in light dark matter searches at the near detector. This is where it's kind of produced in the beam line um, and many other different things uh, as well. So I just want to talk a little bit about the prototyping now. Um, I do a lot of work on protogen, so I'd be happy to give a 30 minute talk about this. Um, but I don't think the organizers will be very happy. So uh, I'll keep it brief. Um, it collected charged particle test beam data um, at CERN in 2018. Um, it was very successful and ran at uh, kind of design parameters. So the 500 volt per centimeter electric field was stable. Uh, more than 99% of the readout channels are active and working as uh, they should be. Um, it has a very high signal to noise ratio. Um, well above the kind of the lowest uh, acceptable values we could have for June. Um, it has a very broad uh, hadron argon cross-section measurement program um, that I would have liked to show you some results of, but they'll be coming this year. Um, and just as an example of a plot in our pion charge exchange analysis, so the beam pion comes in here, uh, undergoes an interaction emitting a proton down here, and then you get these two uh, very nice uh, photon showers from the decay of the pi zero. Um, and there's some more information uh, you can find there for protogen itself. Um, I briefly mentioned the near detector two by two demonstrator. So this is going to be collecting uh, neutrinos from NUMI uh, very soon. So this will be the first part of the kind of June equipment that goes into a neutrino beam. So that's uh, something exciting to look forward to towards the end of the year. Um, this is what I meant by the native 3D pixel readout. Um, this is from one of the modules running uh, at BERN. Um, there was also a dual phase liquid argon TPC, uh, protogen dual phase that collected cosmic data at CERN alongside the, the single phase detector. Um, this design kind of evolved into the vertical drift option I've been uh, discussing. Um, and recently, the, the three view PCB readout uh, has been tested at uh, CERN in a small test stand. Um, and you can see the three readout views here. Um, and a full size uh, protogen vertical drift will be constructed at CERN uh, in the coming years as well. So, to summarize, I, I hope I've convinced you June has a, a wide and um, strong physics program, uh, unique in some ways and also complementary to uh, Hyper-K that we'll hear about next. Um, in particular, it, it can measure the mass ordering and CP violation 
um, with no dependence uh, on outside constraints. Um, and I think we've made excellent progress in the last few years towards realizing June as an experiment. Uh, we have a very successful prototyping program that's kind of demonstrating at every stage of the development that uh, our designs will work. The FAR detectors starting, well, the holes where the FAR detector will go are appearing. Um, and there's also preparations for the beam line in the detector facilities um, underway at Fermilab. So, um, yeah, thanks for your attention, everyone. for this nice presentation. There was a lot to cover, but yeah. you did a great job, I think. Uh, we have time for some questions. Okay, first one is there, and then I will come back. A very quick one. We were discussing that at lunch. Uh, can you give us an update on when we expect the first physics results from Dune? First physics results? Uh, we discussed that. Okay, <laughs> so it's prepared. It's a good question. I, I would hope from the, the phase one running, maybe the, the middle of 20, the 2030s, maybe Ines wants to comment on that as well. Um, <laughs> Let's say at the end of this decade, we should have the first results coming from Non beam events. Okay, yes. On the phase one. I mean, yeah, the Dune is not only result. about the beam physics, of course, and I think Hyper-K also will cover about that. So uh, we expect to have the first results, physics results, but from non beam events, let's say at the end of this decade. That's our hope, uh, the current schedule of the phase yeah. one. And, and soon after, we'll have the, the beam. Well, thank you. I think there was, I don't remember who was first, a lot of. Uh, Ah. Yeah, uh, two questions. Uh, one is uh, the uh, <clears throat> when will the decision be made about the technology of module three and four? And this, my second question is uh, for this uh, PCB style readout, uh, can this not be done with uh, horizontal drift or is it just a lot easier with vertical drift? Um, first question, well, I might start with the second question. Um, <laughs> oh, I've forgotten the first one already. Uh, <laughs> um, I think, I think you could do it in the horizontal drift, but, um, in terms of the horizontal drift design, it's kind of fully realized and it's the, the final versions of the, the detector are now the APAs themselves, the anode planes are completely finished their design and they're being put into protodune now. So the ones that are going into protodune will eventually actually go off to the fire detector and be plugged in there. So um, the horizontal drift uh, concept is kind of finalized and will happen as it is. Um, the, the vertical drift, um, I mean, it, it has very promising um, results from just this small test stand and a, a cold box test at CERN. Uh, and it will then go into um, a full scale kind of uh, protodune style uh, prototype as well. Um, so I, I don't know the official answer for when the decisions we've made uh, for modules three and four, but um, yes to avoid any panic. Absolutely, this is a hot topic that we are discussing even uh, in the snow mass uh, context. So we started that discussion in, in 2019 with a specific workshop on the uh, module of opportunity, that is the name of the four, fourth module. And um, after the COVID and all the things, it was somehow on hold and we are now to, to continue uh, we, we are going to recuperate this workshop and organize uh, another one that will be probably after the summer, where we are going to gather all the community again, because there were many uh, interesting ideas to be explored. And there has been a lot of uh, white papers also proposing several options. So the collaboration is, is going to take that from now on. And uh, I would say that we need to take a decision, uh, I mean, to do some R&Ds, we should select some proposals and then go on 
with the, with the final designs. Uh, I mean, we, we need to incorporate that in the prototype program. Thanks, and thanks, Ines. I think there was a question from there. Yeah, I have a question not about politics. Um, can you can you go to the sterile neutrino sensitivity curve on, on page 30? Yes. So there are two things I don't quite understand about that curve. The first one is, so you have extremely good sensitivity at the delta M square range that corresponds to the near detector baseline, uh, whereas other experiments like uh, MINOS, for instance, have a more uniform sensitivity. Basically, at low delta M square, the near detector calibrates the far detector, and at high delta M square, the far detector calibrates the near detector. And so you're always limited by the detector with the worse statistics. So why is it that you have so much better uh, uh, sensitivity in the regime where, where the oscillations are happening in the near detector? Is that because the near detector is so sophisticated due to the prism concept that it calibrates itself that you because basically this looks like a sensitivity that's mostly given by statistical uncertainties at the near detector. So what's canceling the systematics there? Um, that's a good question. I don't think I have the answer to that. Uh, I think that curve doesn't have any systematics in it. He, he said the curve doesn't have systematics in it. Okay, that also answers that. That would also answer the second question, namely, what happens at very, very high delta M square, where you're in the averaging regime, both in the near and in the far detector, because there the limit should basically indicate the level of systematic uncertainties uh, that you have on your on your beam. Mm -hmm. But if if those are not fully in this curve, yet, and I know it's a relatively new result, so. Well, it might be more interesting than that. And, and I, I I have no idea. But on the other hand. Uh, in, in the far detector, in that regime, you have structure in the near detector. So that's more robust than, uh, you know, so, so having some oscillatory looking structure there probably buys you a lot of that sensitivity as far, you know, and, and you can even use, in quotes, you can use the far detector to normalize the near detector, which is unusual, but you have enough data there. But, but I think the fact that you have structure probably explains why you can go to these uh, uh, pretty small numbers, I, I suspect. And again, as, uh, as, as Mateus mentioned, they probably did not look at systematics carefully. Yeah. But it doesn't completely flatten. Yeah, I, I would have okay. to check here uh, about this, the situation with the systematics. Uh, just to point out here that this, this curve from MINOS is the, the combined one with Diabay, which kind of pulls this region out with respect to the, the top. But yeah, you're, you're right that up here, this is just basically this sensitivity is just fully your flux uncertainty, right? Yeah. Okay, we have another question. Yeah, so I was going to ask the same question about that curve. But I, so we discussed this curve in the context of snow mass when comparing this limit projection with other curves. And the conclusion was that this doesn't have systematics taken into account. But I agree with Andre that uh, there would be structure that you can look for there. And this is I, my naive guess is mostly dominated by backgrounds and your systematics on the backgrounds because it's an appearance search. Uh, this point. is a combination of the new new disappearance and the new e appearance search. Uh, I believe. But, but in this appearance, I doubt that you could ever get a 10 minus 4 mixing angle, which is. Right, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the disappearance gives us a very strong limit on u mu four compared to the appearance one, which mostly probes e four, right? Your your power there. My assumption is that your power at that large delta m squared limit is coming from appearance, and the fact that if you have perfect control of your background of new e's, you'd know very well how many new mu's have transversed to new e's. In, in, in this appearance, I don't see how you could ever reach such small mixing angles. Okay. But so, so maybe we can discuss that over coffee breaks or something. Yeah, sure. Uh, my other question was um, very simple. So for Protodune, is it worth thinking about physics cases that one can do with the detector after you have your test runs? So this is potentially a dumb suggestion, but 
could one think of a source that I can lower into the tech into the detector somehow to do something like a radioactive source in the experiment? Um, so we have, so it, yeah, it, I mean, it, it kept running after this beam test until earlier this year um, or last year, sorry. Um, and so it collected cosmics over quite a long time. And then there, it has been doped a bit with xenon to, to see the effect of the, the increased light yield you get from xenon. Um, it also had a neutron source put in at the top um, to see the, the response to the neutrons. Um, I think that analysis will be converging fairly soon. Um, as to the, so it's going to run again in autumn uh, from this year, uh, refitted slightly to the final design of the uh, APAs here. Um, the, the full run plan isn't fully decided yet. Um, obviously, the main purpose will be to collect beam data, um, but um, I'm sure that beyond that, there, there could maybe be some discussions about other things that could be done. Um, I mean, personally, I certainly want to see as much out of protogen as we can get. I think it's easy to forget that this is the biggest liquid argon TPC ever built. So uh, we can hopefully use it for plenty of physics uh, as well as uh, demonstrating that uh, these designs work. Okay, so I think we have time for another question and then I hope it's quick. So thank you for the talk. I wanted to know, uh, like two questions. I hope one is quick. What about, you said that fourth module would have extended sensitivity to the MEV scale uh, neutrinos. So is it already decided if it will happen or not? And then the connected question, like what is the limiting factor for the sensitivity to, to MEV scale neutrino uh, energies? So this kind of follows on from what Ines was saying that um, we've had this one um, so-called module of opportunity workshop um, design where people are putting forward different ideas for this fourth module. Um, so it's not guaranteed that uh, this will happen, um, but it, some of some of these proposals have this feature. Um, the the current limiting factor, um, I think some of it would come down to the uh, photo, the kind of photon system coverage uh, that we have. Um, and perhaps there'll be some other things that I can't think of off the top of my head. Okay. Just you have a comment on this or is it just not? Uh, I have a different question. <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> Um, uh, my question is about your CP violation sensitivity. Uh, yeah, I, I saw this a plot in the neutrino theory frontier workshop that showed that the dune cannot reach four sigma uh, sensitivity for CP violation. Was that like an official dune uh, analysis or is that some independent? Uh, do you, are you aware of it? Or uh, I don't think I've seen that plot. I okay. would have no idea what exposure that corresponds to, but um, yeah, that sounds very low, so I don't know where that's come from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we thank you again. Thanks. And. Uh,